excited and grateful for the opportunity to bring God's word to all of us this morning. Nineteen seventy-nine, a guy named Douglas Adams released a book known as The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, okay, so people know it. We know about this book. This is good. Well, that if you know the book, you know that in the book, there's a supercomputer known as Deep Thought. And Deep Thought was constructed by some race of aliens forever ago to answer, well, the, to, to discover really actually the answer, because the question is a whole other complicated thing. If you know, you know. Uh, to discover the answer, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Okay, so deep thought is going to produce the answer to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And after computing and processing and being in deep thought for seven and a half million years, it produced an answer. Are you ready for the answer to the, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? 42. 42. This is the answer that it came up with. 42. The answer to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. 42. I could just pray right now. We can end and all go home, right? No. This is absurd. 42. That doesn't even mean anything. How could that be the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? See, Douglas Adams' book, The Meaning of Life, is absurd and useless. It's absurd and it's useless. And it produces an equally absurd and useless existence. Now, that's not much of a, an answer, right, 42, but if I were to ask you what the meaning of life is, well, you might have a few things to say. You might have some words to describe what life is like, to sort of capture the essence of, of life, right? Like, philosophy is devoted to this whole ordeal of searching for meaning and trying to understand what life is. It's important how we answer the question because the way we answer the question, what is the meaning of life, will at least in part determine how we live in this life. It'll give us perspective on this life. This morning, we begin our series the book, the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. And as we begin, the author intends to impart wisdom to us as we seek to understand what life is and how best to live in this life. So I want to invite John Bousquet. He's going to come forward and he's going to read our passage for us this morning. Our passage this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. 
to the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, and man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Let's go before the Lord and ask the Spirit's assistance as we hear from the Word this morning. Gracious and most merciful Father, we come in dire need of your Spirit to open our minds and our hearts to your Word and the things that you reveal therein. Lord, we come tired, cold, empty. Lord God, give us strength, warm our souls, and fill us with life. We pray and ask these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So Ecclesiastes, we open up, and he begins by introducing himself. The author introduces himself to us, right? The words of the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, some debate about who the author to Ecclesiastes is. There's not really any uniform way of understanding this book, which is shocking and difficult when you're planning a sermon series around it. But some say it's got to be Solomon, right? Solomon was a son of David, and he was the king in Jerusalem. And being that it's a wisdom book, a book that's meant to impart wisdom, Solomon, when asked by God as a very young king to give Solomon, Solomon ask anything, I'll give you anything. What's he asked for? He asked for wisdom. So it seems to make sense. Okay, maybe it's, maybe it's Solomon. The issue is that Solomon's name doesn't really, it's never used in the book. Like, not even once. And even here, it says the words of the preacher kind of seems to indicate that the author is, dis is using Solomon, but is distanced from him in some ways. We do get a name. We do get a name. The name is Koheleth. Koheleth, which is the Hebrew word for preacher, sometimes translated teacher. Whoever the author is, his name is Koheleth, and he was most likely a very wise person who probably existed some time after Solomon, but was sort of embodying Solomon because of who he was as a wise person. That if you wanted to know something about what this life was like, Solomon was actually probably a decent person to embody that message, given the wisdom that he had and the breadth of life that he lived. Right? You want to know wisdom. You want to look for wisdom. You want to be a wise person. I hope that each and every one of us at least knows a wise person in our life. It can go to them to ask them how to act wisely in this life. I've even just recently started meeting with a a retired bishop of, an Angli of the Anglican Church just to, to gain wisdom myself as a young pastor from a man who has been in ministry for, the mo for most of his life. It's because we need wisdom, and we need to go to wise people to get it. So, okay, we have a very impressive person embodying wisdom here, a very wise person to go to to ask, what is life? Teacher, preacher, teach us. What is life like? Give us a thesis statement, a purpose statement for life. Well, he gives an answer. And this answer is a thesis statement really for the whole book, and it appears 30 times throughout the book. 
five of those occurrences are right here. It's a high percentage. So teacher, what is life? He says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Oh, hold up. Vanity? Are we like reading the Bible anymore? Have we ditched it? Are we looking at Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or some other hopeless book that has nothing really of any value to say about the reality of this life? Vanity? How can the, the Bible say, how can the preacher say to us that life is vanity? Well, vanity comes from this Hebrew word, hebel. Hebel is defined as emptiness or vanity. Figuratively, something transitory or unsatisfactory. Metaphorically, it, it, it's a, in terms of a, a picture, it's like vapor or smoke or the wind. Michael Eaton says this about vanity. He says, it's a wisp of vapor, a puff of wind, a mere breath, nothing you could get your hands on, the nearest thing to zero. That is the vanity this book is about. So as I was thinking about this vanity, I realized that in my own life, sometimes when people come and they ask me, hey, how you doing? I respond by saying, I'm tired. I don't want to cover it. You know, I'm going to try to hide things in, in my life. Like, everything's great, right? Like, no, I'm tired. But I realized as thinking about that response, that what I'm trying to express, right? I'm not physically tired. I'm not emotionally tired. I'm, I'm something that I can't quite get my hands on. Something that I can't quite put into words. I know that... All I know is that I just can't get my hands around this life. That life is eluding me in some way. Like trying to hold smoke or air in my hands. That once I think that I have it, as soon as I open my hands, I realize that I've lost it. Life is like waking up in the morning and realizing that you have to do it all over again. It's like finishing a task and knowing that there are only more tasks to complete. Life is a vague sense of unfulfillment. And then ultimately in this life, we live through the vague sense of unfamiliar, only to get to the end of it and die. The ultimate tragedy in a life full of a, just a vague sense of unfulfillment. The ultimate tragedy of Hebel, of vanity, is that everyone dies. This is the thesis statement for the book. This is what the preacher says life is. And it doesn't matter where any of us come from this morning. Whether you've been a Christian your whole life. Or you're skeptical of Christianity this morning. Or you're hostile to Christ. We all have to wrestle with the fact that this life is vanity and then we die. That's what this book is about. But the preacher wants to impart wisdom. Given the factors that we have to deal with, he wants to avoid pitfalls so that we might live wisely in this life full of vanity. So he begins by asking a question. He says, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? What does a man gain? 
What benefit can he expect from his work? It's a good question. It's a good hope, right? We all hope for jobs that come with benefits, right? Jobs that pay well so that we can live comfortable lives. Even in the original Hebrew, the word for gain is itself an economic term. He's talking to men and women who are preoccupied with the cares of this life, who are simply trying to make ends meet. That's all of us, right? Living this life, simply trying to make ends meet. We hope our work will mean something in the future. We hope to be satisfied with it after it all. Hope we'll have some lasting meaning and purpose in this life. But there's a very important phrase, another important phrase, the book full of important phrases, that the author uses. He uses 29 times throughout the book. And it's the title of our series, Under the Sun. This phrase, under the sun, is meant to communicate a way of living life that is merely horizontal, with a horizontal vision of life. The looking at life apart from God, a sort of practical secularism or a practical godlessness. Ultimately, this passage presents us with a very hard truth. That apart from God, the hope for gain is vanity. And he does this in three movements, which are our movements, our, our points this morning. First, apart from God, the hope of progress is vanity. Verses four through seven. The hope for satisfaction is vanity. Verse eight. And the hope for purpose is vanity. Verses 9 through 11. First, apart from God, the hope for progress is vanity. The author picks up the question immediately, and he looks at the sort of big picture in creation. Right? We read, verse 4, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The grand scheme of things, generations rise and they fall. They come and they go. They are born and they die. But there is no permanent generation. No one can stick around for very long. Each generation is temporary. This issue, this reality is amplified when the passing generations are contrasted with the seemingly fixed existence of the earth. The earth remains forever. People go on to just die generation after generation while this massive inanimate object just continues to rotate around the sun seemingly forever. It's like activity, right? But not really progress. Things are happening. They're not really going anywhere. And then he further amplifies this by looking at other parts of creation. Starting at verse 5, he says, The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, and around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full, to the place where the streams flow. There they flow again. Activity without progress, right? The sun, it rises and it sets. Unending movement. It progresses in movement without really doing anything. It just sort of does what it does. But the wind... It blows. Sounds like a pun. The wind, it blows. 
And around and around the wind blows, continuing on its circuit. And maybe we're uh, feeling the wind to our back to be surprised that, oh, the wind has changed directions and now it's hitting us in the face. Only to realize very quickly that all, of it's, all it's doing is the same thing that it was doing before. The streams flowing endlessly, right? Flowing into whatever it is, a lake, a larger body of water. Only for that stream to flow and flow and flow, but it doesn't seem like anything is filling. It just pours over and over and over again, endlessly. This is all an endless monotony, a hopelessly tedious world where things are just moving, progressing without any, sorry, activity without any progress. So much happening, really very little happening. A certain pop scientists out in the world these days would have you think that, oh, no, 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 like apart from God, when we look at the created world and we study science, whether biology or chemistry or physics, right, when we look at the created world, we can find so much meaning. There's so much hope for progress. But when we look at this and we look at creation, the reality is, is that creation itself says otherwise. Creation itself is just on this tedious movement over and over and over over again, right? And some here, maybe you're skeptical of Christianity this morning, but you've found some sliver of, of hope in the certainty that science says that it gives us. A scientific progress is valuable. We need it. And it's like incredible as well, worth studying. But at the end of the day, when we look at creation apart from God, we are left with nothing but a never-ending treadmill of movement toward nothing. Right? Think of that, a treadmill. Where are you going? Everywhere? Nowhere. Treadmill. That apart from God, progress in the world is a futile attempt to grasp at straws. People live, and then they die. And the earth just completes its course around and around and around the sun. One commentator wrote, the earth methodically plodding along its routine course does not skip a beat in its rhythm to celebrate a man's birth nor to mourn his death. Friends, apart from God, the hope for progress is vanity. So what kind of conclusion right, can man come to in witnessing this? What kind of consolation is left for us if progress is lost? Well, we next, we see that Apart from God, the hope for satisfaction is vanity. Take a look at verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. All things are full of of weariness. Like eating a mediocre meal for eternity. Or standing in the DMV line forever. It's like when Beetlejuice is in the neither world, in the neither world waiting room, and he's, let me get, I gotta get this right, and he's, Nine quadrillion, nine hundred ninety-eight trillion, three hundred eighty-three. I did that wrong. Three hundred eighty-three million seven hundred fifty thousandth in line. And then it shows the ticker. It says now serving. Three. 
the world in its endless monotony of being filled but never filled. A true picture of life apart from God. Weariness. Tedium. Where does this weariness leave mankind? Totally unsatisfied. Mankind cannot even speak of it. There's a whole tradition in philosophy that devoted itself to sort of the hopelessness of existence, to going on and on and on about how hopeless life is. They surely, they want to tell you about it. One such philosopher had this to say about life. He said, the final aim of history is a crumbling field of ruins. Its final meaning is the sand blown through the eye holes of human skulls. If that's not bleak, I don't know what is. Neither is mankind satisfied with sight and the things that he sees. Life is like the phrase, nothing to see here. My wife and I go on vacation. We, uh, for a while, were going to modern art museums. And it was novel and interesting for a moment. I mean, I might just be too dumb to understand uh, some of the things. But like, it was novel and interesting for a moment. But when you see one banana duct tape to a wall, you've seen every banana duct tape to a wall. <laughs> Once you've stepped into a room, a, a room piled with like photographs, to symbolize all of our digital clutter, I get it, right? You stepped into every room, just there were piles of photographs. Everything novel, all, every novel sight becomes old hat immediately. Neither is mankind satisfied with hearing. That just like the rivers, our ears are endlessly sound, right? Like, Things endlessly flow into them, and we're just never satisfied, never full with the things that we get. We just continue to desire to receive more. Friends, apart from God, life is full of discontent. It's full of unsatisfaction. We're all just endlessly waiting to receive things that will never satisfy us. We all live in the tension of this phrase, right? If only I could just get. If only I could just have. If only I could just get that promotion. If only I could just get that other job or that other house. If only I could just get a break. If only I could just get a vacation, finish the house projects, watch a little TV. If only I could just get people to love me. If you're single here, if only I could just get a spouse, then I'll be satisfied. If only I could just get intimacy. Intimacy, one of the deepest longings of the human heart, which is one reason that pornography is such an evil and wicked thing that it preys on our desire, in some senses our need for intimacy, that it feeds the flesh but never satisfies. And in doing so, it distorts what it means to be truly human. If you're a man or a woman here struggling with porn, please know that your issue isn't porn. It's that you're seeking intimacy apart from God. You're looking to fill that intimacy whole with something that will 
destroy you. Something that will never satisfy. Friends, life inevitably grows stale. We're creatures who always crave more and more and more. But the reality is, is that apart from God, the hope for satisfaction is vanity. But you might say to me, Ethan, of course it's vanity. It's so temporary, right? It's so carnal. We should look for tr meaning. We should look for purpose. The deep things of this life. Perhaps then we can find what we're really looking for. But we also see that apart from God, the hope for purpose is vanity. Look at verses 9 through 11 with me. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things later things, later things yet to be among those who come after. Can we find purpose, meaning, an advancement, an invention? After all, look at all we've accomplished as a human race. Look at all the medical advancements that we've made. I'm going to raise my hand and say I'm the first person to benefit from medical advancements as a person with diabetes. I'm happy for medical advancements. Look, we live in an age where more people live, fewer die. This is true and good. But apart from God, what life are we just sticking around to experience more of? Longer monotonous life and unsatisfying existences. Now, Sam Storms helpfully dissects some of these issues when he makes this comment. He says, This is not a comment on mankind's mechanical inventiveness. The teacher does not deny that new ideas for improving life, new expressions of reality, new gadgets are whatever constantly appearing, he simply says that try as we might to invent and to find our efforts at finding something new under the sun whereby to unlock the meaning of life forever fails. This is where the author even concludes. In the end, even after perhaps all of our inventiveness, all of our ideas, all of everything doesn't even have any hope of being remembered. That there is no lasting legacy given enough time that won't be forgotten. Right, can we even fathom the kingdoms that have risen and fallen and we just have never even heard about them? How many books even have been totally lost to time, and the only reason we might know that they exist is because somebody just mentioned it until we lose that book. <laughs> we think we can do it, right? We think we can find meaning in our post-enlightenment, our post-modern world where we're self-made people in a self-made age. Well, we think this only for enough time to pass. Enough time to pass for us to forget. Derek Kidner wrote, the more things change, the more they turn out to be the same. In their new guise, the old ways go on. As a race, we never learn. Brothers and sisters, apart from God, 
the hope for gain is vanity. All are toiling for progress, satisfaction, and purpose is vanity. Apart from God, we live in a vicious world full of monotony and futility. A world where people simply live and then die. Is this how you're living your life? Searching for meaning without reference for God? I ask the question, how do we get here? How is it that life is this way? Really, Ecclesiastes is a sustained commentary on a post-Genesis 3 world, on a world fallen and affected by sin, a world subject to futility and vanity, a world in which if we look at it horizontally, if we look at it under the sun, if we look at it apart from God, we see that the hope for gain is totally vain. So what are we left with? That's where the text ends. But where are we left this morning? Romans 8, verses 20 through 21. Paul says, for the creation was subjected to futility. In Greek, that's the counterpart to the Hebrew hebel. Paul's referring to Ecclesiastes. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. If your vision of this life is under the sun, you'll miss what God is doing and has been doing since the fall. That hope in this life alone is vain. But hope in God is not vain. That hope in God means something. That the Lord uses vanity, futility in this life to draw us to himself. That we were made not only for this life, but for another life, for another life, that the Lord has rescued us from the bondage of corruption so that we might obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Is that you this morning? Knowing that Jesus Christ came into the world, into this vain world, in order to redeem it. That Jesus Christ, by his toil, by his toil, has achieved, has gained progress, given man satisfaction, and has brought us true purpose. That through his death and resurrection, he makes all things new. Is there anything new in this life? No. In Christ Jesus, all things are new. Amen? That the vanity of this life is meant to draw us to God. That the hopeless, tiresome, mundane monotony of this life is meant to draw us to our highest good. To the eternal, almighty, good, gracious God in whose face we see in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who has saved us from vanity and given us hope, given us satisfaction, given us purpose. Does it fix the vain life in which we live? No, it doesn't. We still have to deal with the vanity of life. We still have to get up and deal with the mundaneness of it, the monotony of it. We still have to cry. We still have to witness people around us die. But all of that is meant to draw us 
to something meaningful, eternal, something lasting, something that is found in Christ Jesus alone. The freedom of glory is the children of God. That in him, our labor is not in vain. If, you're, if you aren't a Christian this morning, apart from God, you can expect vanity to continue. For life to continue to not satisfy. The downside is that you can also expect another life to continue. The next life to leave you utterly unsatisfied for eternity. If anyone here hasn't read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, he has this picture, the whole, it's in a parable of hell, a parable in which hell is this sort of like existence where everyone gets mad at their neighbor and then they just move for eternity only to find themselves in new places where they continue to be mad at their neighbor and they're just frustrated and empty for eternity. Not the vision of hell that we're familiar with, but a eternal, futile, and vain existence. Friends, if you aren't a Christian, that is what you can expect. But if you hope in God through Christ, you can expect purpose. You can expect to see and to know the highest good that we could possibly know, which is God himself. If you come to Christ in faith, you'll have hope in this life, as vain as it might be, but you'll have eternal hope and rest in the next. If you are a Christian here this morning, don't live as if this life were the only one. Don't do it. Don't just wake up, go to work, and go to bed. You will do that, but don't only do that. Live as a people with an eternal perspective. Live as a person who knows Christ Jesus, who sees the work that we do together here as a church, not as vain, but as meaningful, as with great purpose. A work which provides hope to our souls and to those around us. Paul knew this. We read, he says in, in Philippians, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. What hope of our toil? What hope for gain? that we might gain Christ. Friends, this is a bleak passage. It's a bleak book. We see at the end of this that apart from God, hope for gain is vanity. So hope in God. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious and most merciful Father, we know that you have subjected this world to futility so that we might be set free from corruption, that we might be set free as your children. Lord, we're tired. We're sad. We still live in this world. But, oh God, give us hope. Satisfy our souls and give us purpose in the world to come. Be glorified, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.